today, actually, I'm going to continue on the Gospels that we left on last week. And the title I have fixed for today's message is Pray and Do Not Lose Heart. Um, not sure whether do you often get disheartened in your prayer. We Christians know that we have a, this privilege from God, that is, we can come to God, we can pray, and uh, God will listen to us. And He clearly tells us in His Word that you pray because He listens. However, it is not surprising also that although we know that we enjoy this privilege, but the truth is we also hardly pray. Um, I believe there are many reasons to it, but I also know that none of them are good ones. I'm not sure whether you can relate to this. Sometimes we don't pray because we are lazy, we lack of discipline. Sometimes we are just too tired to pray, and especially if you're just busy through the whole day of work and studies. Sometimes you just can't be bothered enough with other people's needs. So not only do we not pray for ourselves, we don't pray for others. And sometimes we just have this false sense of independence. Um, although we never blatantly say it, but we know that, hey, we are managing okay. That's why we also don't pray. Sometimes the reason why we hardly pray is because we do not believe enough of God's promise, especially when God says that He timely provides. Sometimes uh, the promise that we know of is God will save, but it doesn't seem to be happening. And thus, we start to not believe enough of God's promise. Sometimes it's just outright rebellion. God asks us to pray and we want to pray actually, but we just don't want to do it. We just refuse. We are just being stubborn with God. Um, but there's this reason of not praying that uh, God especially doesn't want all of us to fall into. That is, God does not want us to stop praying because we lose heart. And I believe this is a state not uh, strange to us. There are times we really find it very hard to keep on praying because especially we pray for certain things, it remains there. Nothing seems to change. Um, sometimes um, I pray that God don't let me fall sick. It seems like I've, ever since I was telling my husband, ever since I got married, <laughs> I keep falling sick. It, it has nothing to do with him. It's just the state that um, I keep going into. So I ask God to deliver me from the sickness so, so that I can do His work. But sometimes I stop praying because God doesn't do it. I still fall sick. So, so before I know it, I, I'm healed. And now I'm back to a cycle of cough and cold and flu and sore throat. So sometimes I also stop praying because of this. And sometimes we pray for uh, certain things, but it just gotten worse. Like we pray for good results, but instead this semester we got a worse result. Sometimes uh, we pray for a partner, but we are still alone. We pray for a child, but we are still childless. So sometimes it seems like praying already. Um, God doesn't seem to be responding. There's no movement at all. So there will be time that we start to doubt if God is even listening. Does He even bother at all? And we may, for this reason, start to lose heart and give up praying. And I think Jesus knows us very well. Since the beginning of gospel, he taught us to pray. He said, pray. And he knows it's easy to lose heart when you are living in this uh, earth because there are so many things that attack us that rob away our faith. So today, um, Jesus tells us a parable to his people to encourage them to always pray and not to lose heart. So let's quickly turn to the scripture today. It's very simple, eight verses. Then Jesus told told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So we have heard of many, many parables all this while, right? Some, some parables include the prodigal son, the parable of the shrewd manager. But one common thing in all these parables is, um, usually we do not know why Jesus tells that parable until the very end of the story. But this parable is a bit different. Jesus tells the disciple what is the purpose of him telling you this parable is for you to always pray, pray and not give up. Meaning Jesus wants you to get his emphasis correct. He doesn't want to stand a chance of interpretation error. So he clearly wants you to get it. Don't give up when you pray. So move on to verse 2. He said in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, 
even though I don't fear God nor care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. <clears throat> and the Lord say, Listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So it's a very short eight verses. Um, so in, in this parable, right, we see that they are very true, very, uh, very true and strong characters, these two characters. One is the judge, and Jesus says he is an unjust judge. Okay? Another is the widow. And something about this judge is he's very horrible. Why? Because he is supposed to be in a position that, that exercises the justice, the righteousness of people, but he's not doing so. He's unconcerned, unbothered about people's plight. And from the story, we are told that he neither fear God or care about his people. And this is very much like the people we see in this world today. They are in a very influential position. It's around us. Uh, and they think very highly of themselves. And they have no regard for anyone, including God. Who is God? Okay. So these are the kind of people that this unjust judge is referring to. And we have these people surrounding us today. On the other hand, we have a widow here. This widow represents a vulnerable uh, population in a society in, in Jesus' time. Why? Because she lost her husband. Um, the husband is the very person who can protect her and defend for her. And not only so, her life is already so miserable. Her encounter with this judge is also very miserable. In the old days, right, if they want to uh, get the judge to hear their plea or give them justice, usually people need to pay a large amount to bribe them to, to do or to even listen. But this video, we also can um, get from the story that she is poor. Uh, why? Because she brings no money. She just brings her plea repeatedly to the judge. That's the only thing that she can ask for and she can fight for. When, um, and we know that this, this widow is also very pathetic because the judge don't bother to listen to her at all. So, so this widow represents a very marginalized group of people in this world. But sometimes um, it, is, it is also true in our shoes. Sometimes we Christians also find ourselves in a very vulnerable and pathetic state in this world. Uh, although the Bible keeps telling us you are children of God, but the physical state is as if you are under the mercy of a lot of people. And not only so, people take advantage of you, people bully you, and sometimes the deliverance just don't come. You continue to be um, being sidelined, being marginalized, and being laid off just like this widow and this unjudged judge. So, if you find that you are a widow, I mean, not a widow, uh, you are so vulnerable and sometimes you are so defenseless, God wants to tell you today through this parable is that you are not undefended. You are not alone. Why? Just for a simple fact that in the Bible, God keeps telling people that um, he is the defender of the widow. Okay? So God defends his people. So when we come back to this widow's story, she knows that she's poor and she has nothing else. And when she has nothing else, there's, there's only left with one thing she can keep on doing. And that is coming to the judge to cry for justice. So eventually she bothers the judge so much that he's so annoyed that even though the judge is very unrighteous, he eventually gave in. And I think sometimes mm, I see some common situation happening is when the kids keep bothering the parents like, I want to buy this, I want to buy this, I want to buy this for a hundred or a thousand times. So eventually, do you find your parents giving to you? So certain, certain, comp, uh, certain similarities seem to be happening today too. So after saying this parable, uh, Jesus read up saying that uh, if the horrible judge is like that, how much more is God who loves and saves you? He will be much, much better than this judge, isn't it? And if the widow will not give up crying for justice, we also shouldn't give up praying to God, regardless the reasons we have. And most importantly, um, 
the gist is you are not praying to a judge like that. You are praying to a loving father who sent his son to die for you when you are still an enemy to God. So, so a very simple parable, but how is this related to our prayer life in particular? So from Jesus' warning, right, we know that there's one deadly poison in believers' prayer life. And that is a discouraged heart. And this is where enemy usually work. The discouraged heart is the very thing that Jesus doesn't want us to fall into, which is why he tells us this parable. And um, I think sometimes it's truly very hard to persist in prayer. Like sometimes we pray already, things still, as if problems still keep coming, illness don't, come, don't go away. We pray for our loved ones to get healed from the illnesses, but they remain sick. We pray for jobs, but our job, uh, we pray for a better job, but our job is still the same. We still earn the same amount of money. So when the things do not turn out as we pray, it's very easy for us, to, for us as humans emotionally to get sad and discouraged. And this is the time when Satan starts to give out a lot of voices to us. Uh, is it because God does, does not like you? Because you have did certain things uh, incorrectly, which he happened to let you be reminded of certain instances whereby you might not have behaved justly and rightly in front of God. Or sometimes Satan will also tell you certain things like you are less holy than the other brother or sister. That's why God does not listen to your prayers. God listens to his prayers. And sometimes Satan even asks you, is God even true? If not, why are you still so uh, sad? Why are you still in your problems? Why things don't go away? Things don't change. Does he even care that you're in pain. So when this happened, right, this is how Satan works through a discouraged heart. It gives you a lot of hints, it gives you a lot of voices. So you're already very discouraged. When Satan just keep building on this discouraged heart, and that's when you start to doubt. Hey, you doubt God's promise. <clears throat> and Satan will, will tend to magnify this doubt in your heart until one day you lose faith in God. And you lose faith in God's promise that when he said, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. You will start to doubt, is this, is this even trustworthy, this God, who say he will work all things for my good. And as a result, we may lose faith in God. And this is the very thing Jesus prayed for, for Peter, that he, do not, he does not lose his faith. But I feel that when we read at the parable today, you look at how the widow responds. Uh, in this parable, when her plea is not being listened or acted upon, acted upon by the judge, she did not grow disheartened. And I think she also don't have right to grow disheartened because if she don't continue to ask for justice, she will reduce back to her old state when all the unjust surrounds her. So similarly, when God sometimes does not seem to respond initially, um, be like the widow, don't get discouraged, continue to press on to pray. Why? Because perhaps, and maybe, and it's true, this is the only thing that you can fall back on. So three things that we can learn from the widow in this parable is, firstly, our identity often is like the widow. We are in need. We are more in need than we think we are. Like what we just sang uh, just now during the worship. And this is the starting point of prayer. How do you know that you are in need? Who breathes life into you today? When you realize this, without even God's breath into you, you can't even walk, you can't even talk. I have such, I can't even utter a word. So you are in need. You are more in need than you think you are. You are more in need of God than you assume yourself to be. And second thing is, don't let the external circumstances or any ungodly encounters around you to determine if you should continue to seek God. So what if you have done right and people don't bother about you? Instead, people just escalate the bad treatment towards you. Do not let this determine whether you should continue to come before God with your plea. Because the God whom you worship created heaven and earth. You wouldn't know things better than God. Maybe he's preparing that person. Maybe God is also preparing you. And the third thing is pray as if this is the only and most important thing that you can do, like the widow. And, and a lot of times, um, we may stop praying 
when things remain unchanged. But it is at this time that um, we have to ask ourselves, is it because we pray to God, just want God to do as we pray? We pray for a spouse. We just want God to give us a spouse. We pray for a good career. We just want God to give us better pay and promotion, etc. Is it that we pray just to talk God into fulfilling our desires? If not, we don't want to look to Him anymore. And when this happens, you should also ask yourself, do you also mentally create an image of God in your heart, in your mind? And this is not a God that the Bible tells you. And second thing is, sometimes we don't pray as if this is the only and the most powerful thing you can do. And it is true, because we may not be in true desperation. We still have friends to rely on. We still have our planning, uh, our, our money, etc. So, but, but the context here is a bit different. Is When you are truly desperate, is prayer the most and the only thing you do the most? Okay? So, so what you truly believe and take refuge in is shown when you are tested in desperation. And that's where you place your faith. So if, let's say, you are severely ill today, I'm not saying that we don't look to a doctor and we just pray. But if through prayers, God convinces you to seek treatment, and even you go to seek treatment, you prepare your heart to listen to what the doctor has to tell you. It may say, no treatment. When I have this ingrown new issue, I go to the GP. I thought he will, he will relieve me, but, um, but I think God somehow prepared my heart a little, and my husband was there to support me. He said, you're pregnant, I can't do anything with you. I was like, what? So I have to endure again and again with this pain and infection that's going on in me. But, but that point, does it truly drive you to desperation that as if your hope is only what the GP can tell you? Or is it because you believe that God has a perfect planning in your life that he, you will not because of this, this infection that is unresolved in your body that, and the pain that is lingering in your body that you will... Uh, let's say miscarriage or you know like life become very miserable. So I think sometimes when I was very desperate, I realized that God revealed uh, what I truly take refuge in. Is it God or is it what people say? Is it this very high profile people what he say? Is it my friends or is it anything that is tangible? And I think God truly wants us to come clean with him. Sometimes. Um, so, so let me share with you a story of Jacob. There's this moment that he was truly very desperate. So in the Bible, Jacob is the one who stole the birthright from his brother Esau. So, so he, he thought that he could get away with it. Indeed, he got away for some time. He stole the birthright, and then the father blessed uh, Jacob wrongly. And in the end, he got to marry uh, the people he liked, although after some suffering, eventually one day he has to face the score, he has to face Esau again. But before he faced Esau, he was very petrified with fear because he knew that Esau is stronger, more muscular, and can kill him just like that. And he's nothing near Esau in terms of capability. So, so he started off deceiving for the birthright. And now he has to come clean with God about this. And how did he come clean with God? So when he was truly desperate, he knew that no one can save him now, that his brother is, is here to confront him and maybe want to wipe him off, him and his family. So he wrestled with God um, in a place. And I think we, we are all very familiar with this story. But why I want to share this story is, I just thought of this story just now. When, when, when Jacob wrestled with God for a long time, he prayed, God, can you deliver me from this tragic things that are going to happen in my life. God, can you bless me? Can you deliver me? But God didn't bother him for a while. God just didn't answer him that prayer. But in the process, in a long while, like as if the judge, for some time he refused. When, when he is wrestling with God during that night for a long, long while, long hours, God asked um, Jacob, what is your name? Do you think God doesn't know what is Jacob's name if he is God? Actually, actually, God knows Jacob is Jacob. But why does God ask him this question? Because that was how he started stealing in the beginning. He started to deceive his father by saying, I am Esau, therefore bless me. So when he wrestled with God, 
God, he knows that he cannot hide from God anymore. He cannot deceive God anymore. He say, God, I am Jacob. Okay? He is not the firstborn. He is not firstborn of the family. He is Jacob. So, so he wrestled with God. And not that God doesn't know. A lot of times we wrestle with God. It's not that God doesn't know what is inside us. But God just wants you to see your heart. What you truly have been honouring all this while. Somehow. And Jacob came clean with God, saying that, I'm Jacob. But he continued to wrestle with God. And eventually, God revealed his, his impurities inside Jacob. But he also restored Jacob by telling him, from this moment onwards, you are called Israel. That's why we have Israelites. Because God is committed to him and will bless you. When you don't act by deception, when you come clean with him. So a lot of times when we are in desperation or when God doesn't seem to be yielding to you, there are two things God might be doing. One is God wants you to see what is inside yourself, what is in your inner heart. Number two is God wants to restore you not want to break you down only. He wants to restore you. And so this is the first, first part about us and God and prayers. Don't get discouraged. God is doing a lot of things in our lives. <coughs> Next, um, like this parable set out to be, God asks us to pray. Why? Because God is good. And I think good is a very simple word. But um, I don't know what else to say God as, but he's really good. Um, why? We look at the scriptures again, and the Lord say, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So, what is this trying to tell you is that why we pray? Because God is good. Because God is everything this judge is not. And that is the only reason we, can, we, we are game enough to approach God. God is totally not like this judge. And, and I think this is a very important starting point in our prayer. What a person believes and does not believe about his God is of great importance. Why? Because you are not better than the God you believe in. For example, if you believe in a God that is unforgiving, you will also be unforgiving. The God you believe in, if He is just and righteous, you want to also live righteously before Him and before people. If your, if your belief about God is He's a glutton, He just eat and eat until very fat, you will also be like a glutton and eat and eat and eat and try to give God a lot of food. And if the God that you know is love, you will also want to be as loving as Him because He is love. So the second part of this parable, when I read it again and again, I realized that it's actually trying to correct our misunderstanding about God so that we truly know that what is the character of God that we are calling upon. And, and I always like to refer to Exodus 34 when, when Moses being revealed about God. God say, the Lord, the Lord, compassion, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. If God is not slow to anger, we will all die, given the amount of sins that we are accumulating every minute. If God is not abounding in love and faithfulness, there will be no hope, there will be no, no, no place for us to stand before Him. Not only so, He maintained His love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So God is just, God is righteous, but He's also loving and compassionate. And I think, I think He is, in a way, He is the perfect attribute, perfect example and source of these attributes of graciousness, mercy, compassionate, and justice. So He is everything this judge is not. This judge is unbothered, unconcerned, uncompassionate, unmerciful, whatever you can think of. So He is God is not, God's character is not a bit better than this judge. He is not a bit more righteous than this judge. Instead, he is the source of justice, righteousness, love, and compassion, as told by, uh, by this Exodus 34. And, and so it is this 
It is on this basis that God encourages us to pray and not to lose heart in prayer. It is the unchanging goodness of God, not the circumstances or the people around us that are liable to change, the reason why we can keep on praying, the reason why we can keep coming to God. And God is above this unjust judge in the parable. And that's the reason why the widow knows that he can keep coming. Because above this God, above this judge, there is this God who is sovereign. He can see that his people are being treated rightly, even through an unrighteous judge. Similarly, God also can use very bad people to discipline his, his very own chosen people when they are being naughty. Just like when we read through the Old Testament, we see that how God raised up a nation like Israel, but when they are unfaithful and idolatrous, God also used Assyria, Babylon, all to wipe them off, just to discipline them. But God also restored them in the end. So God wants to encourage us not to lose heart in prayers because He is who He is. He is just, fair in all His decisions, and righteous in all His ways. And He's defender of the widow and delivers the oppressed. And whenever I think about uh, God's character of justice, um, I always remember this Abraham's prayer. <clears throat> so you remember Abraham, that he had this encounter with, with the Lord. Um, the Lord is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and God told him that he will destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But, but Abraham knows that there's some righteous man living in this city, and one of it is his nephew, Lot. So, he, he, so the fact that God will destroy Sodom and Gomorrah um, without rescuing Lot doesn't seem to tie in the character of God he knows. He knows that God is judge. That's why he says, should the judge of the earth do what is just? Should not. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Meaning, this is God's character. Wouldn't, wouldn't he do what is correct, what is just, what is righteous? Which is why, because he knows God is just, he has, he's game enough, he's bold enough to keep bargaining with, with, with the Lord. Like, will you save if, let's say, this city is left with this amount of people? And God say yes. As if it is not enough, will you save if, let's say, just 30 people or less, 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 or even when there's just 10 people? But the Lord replied to him, yes, if there's only 10 people, I will save these 10 people. So, what, so, so it is on this basis that God is just that we can come to God boldly. And not only so, God is also a loving God. He responds to his elect. Why? Because in, the, in Luke chapter 18, just now we read, God will respond to the one he chosen who cried to him day and night. And the fact that you are chosen in his grace means you are related to him. You are not a nobody in God's eyes. You are not like the widow in front of the unjust judge. You are someone who is related to God. And, and this matters because he has already loved you enough to give you the grace to be able to respond to his gospel. That's why you are sitting here. That's why you are his chosen one. And will he not respond to his chosen ones? So it is on this basis that we can come before God and, and, and pour ourselves to him. And thirdly, he is also a wise God, <coughs> especially with regard to his timing. And, and I think that a lot of times, it's not that we do not know God is this, but it just doesn't sink in when the reality doesn't quite match what our heart desires it to be. We wish it to be like that, but it doesn't seem to work out that way. But it is when the reality conflicts with uh, what your heart desires, you need to place your faith not in the external situation, but on who God is, who God truly is, who God is truly is as told to you in the word of God, not the God whom you chose to fit in based on how you mentally create him to be. So he asks you to persist in prayer, not because you have to wear him down. Sometimes like this parable is not trying to tell you that you have to just bug God like a nuisance like that until one day he will succumb to you. He, he is, Jesus didn't tell this parable to tell you that that's the nature of your relationship with God. He is not trying to tell you that. But he's just trying to tell you that he's just everything this unjust judge is not. And because of that, you can pray continuously. And we pray continuously not because we want to 
um, we want God to change his plan to fit ours. But God asks us to persist in our prayers because he listens and is ready to respond to us. He also wants to clear our doubts. He strengthens our inner power. So, and this is the unchanging character of God that God wants to deepen in our lives. And this is, a, this is also the point about perseverance, not in terms of persevere to get what we want, but more on believing that God hears us and we provide what is needful. And I, I like what Tozer say, God answers our prayers not because we are good. God answers Jacob's prayer not because he is good, but because God is good. And we please God most, not trying to be a goody to shoot in front of him. But maybe that is one of the package you will want to strive to live as when you know that God is in your life. But we please God most when we come to him with all of us. We throw ourselves into his arms. That will mean that you are related to him. If I have a child, I think I'll be most pleased when he just comes to me fearlessly. Not, not when he, he doesn't even bother to share anything with me at all. Or he approached me because he's afraid of me that I'll scold him or whatsoever. So pray because God is good. And you pray because you can praise continuously just because God is who he is. Can you imagine if today God is not who he claimed to be? Then it will be quite disastrous, isn't it? If God is not the God whom he claimed himself to be, he is judge, he is a just, uh, just God, he is a righteous God, he is a loving God, and he is a wise God. And, and remember, you come to God and God wants you to pray, uh, not because you are a nuisance to him, you have to bug him, like how this parable works out, but precisely because it is not like that. And he will listen and respond to us. And this, this is from one of the verses we read very much earlier on. Luke 11, 13. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So God works very infinitely in our lives. Don't let our vision and eyes to rest upon the finite things that we we yearn so much about and miss out the many good blessings that God really wants to give to His children. And, <clears throat> and never mind the timid request before God. Sometimes um, when we pray, I'm not sure whether you will have this, uh, this, this kind of uh, thought. Uh, maybe I shouldn't pray because this is like small matter to God. Like, um, for example, you pray for the rain to stop. Just a very simple-minded. You know that God controls heaven and earth. He controls the rain. God, can you don't let it rain anymore so that I can go out or what? So sometimes we, we thought of a timid request and we stop praying. And, and that's when we drawing lines with God, like what you can come to God, what you cannot come to God. And I don't know when I think about this point, I, I thought of one, one person that is... <laughs> You know Moses, um, Wayne's nephew. So he has this, so he has this good friend called Goofy, and this Goofy is, is 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 his friend. He brings it to childcare center, and without Goofy cannot. So, so one day if if let's say let's say he tells me, Andy, I pray that Goofy will eat this with me next time. Blah blah blah. Will you outrightly tell him, Moses, Goofy is not your friend? He's just a teddy bear. That's it, you know. He will never talk to you. He will never walk with you. He will never eat with you. Get real. I, I think none of us in the right mind will just shatter his, 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 his world just like that, you know. And, and that's what I, I want to say about this timid request. Sometimes we pray in accordance to the faith we receive. But, um, but you as a bystander, you probably... Like, for example, a, a very new, new sister in faith pray about a very simple thing. Will we think that, I, why pray for this low-level thing when God actually asks, wow, evangelism and all this? This is also true. But what I want to say is, your relationship with God is never hindered by your timid request. Just like Moses, when he say one day he wants to pray like this, I wouldn't say that, don't pray like that. I will just let him do that. Until one day he realized that, um, 
this is just a teddy bear because he has grown up, he has grown up in the church, he knows that his friends is, is people like, you know, uh, like Leora next time who can talk to her, talk to him and all those things. He knows that that's called friend. Or until he's prayer mature. Maybe one day he'll tell me, and I don't need good feet anymore, I need God, that's all. So, so what I want to say is, when he's in the right condition, like he's being sheltered with God's word and all, his, his prayer can mature over time. Or, or he, his concern will change. So similarly, when we come to God, never mind our timid requests, because God has the capacity to make you grow through his word, through his spirit, and through your encounters. Only come to God and don't disqualify God because of your own assumptions about Him. And that's how relationship works, isn't it? And sometimes um, I told myself, um, because my voice is not very good, so I say, oh, I will just say whatever I think I can say and it may end up very short. So I think it's good also. So I'm coming to my last point. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes, right, when the waiting seems long and dreadful, like God doesn't seem to be budging after you pray. Remember one thing, there's no unnecessary delay in God. <coughs> Why? I don't cook it up because Luke 18, it tells you. He will see that they get justice and quickly. So this quickly is not an understatement. Meaning, it will not be like what you see as God is not working, God is denying your, your prayers, God is not rejecting you. There's no delay in, in, in God's timing because He is a wise God. And of course, sometimes um, we do feel that hey, God is not responding fast enough. It doesn't seem to come immediately. But His delay is not denial. He will do things right when they need to be done. And Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Though it linger, though it seems to linger for you, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. And, and because God is wise, you can pray like the widow for justice, for salvation of others, for your loved ones to mature in Christ, for yourself to strengthen in Christ, for many, many more, for God to deliver us from a lot of trials that we are facing. Because God never intend to delay justice and righteousness in His people, especially those who are oppressed and all. And in this process, um, what do we do if, if, let's say, it seems to linger for us? And it, there's this thing is, um, the emphasis also is on this parable, is that keep your faith strong when the answers seem delayed. And how do you do that? Is you keep on praying, just like what Jesus encouraged us in this, prayer, in this parable prayer. Prayer parable. We keep on praying, be steadfast, not because we can outdo God by wearing God down, but because God knows better and He will do what is needful and He will open your eyes to see what He's doing. And in the process, you let the Word of God fill and transform ourselves while we are waiting. And this is sometimes, um, it is very hard to be reminded of God's promise when the goings get tough. But it is precisely at this moment that uh, Jesus said, let the Word sanctify you. The Word is truth. The true, the true goal is in the word, not in the things that can quickly change like a shadow. So, so instead of letting the outside to change you, let the word of God fill you and transform you while waiting. It will mean that sometimes you will allow the word of God when you hear, it change your perspective of certain things. It change your thinking. It, it change how you want to live before God. And pray to experience God more, not to have your desired outcomes. And, and one thing that I realized in my prayer life, and I'm sure in your prayer life, is sometimes we bring one prayer to God, but God can change us um, in the process by changing our prayer. We, bring, we, we, we start to pray for ourselves when we come to God. But as time goes by, we, God makes us weaken this prayer about our own desires. But God starts to increase our desire to pray for others, for His people, for his kingdom, for people not to be so uh, crushed in spirit and not knowing that they are loved. Sometimes we bring our grievances to God. God, this is really, really very awful. This person is like, treat me so under. We can come to God with so much grievances, like, like how unjustly we are treated. But 
but you'll be surprised. God may enlarge your capacity and make you love the very unlovely people in this world and turn your attention to God rather than what you are being shortchanged of currently. And, and I think this third point is um, what God trained me most um, when I pray and doesn't seem to, seem to have the response that I desire. Is he wants me to rest on him more, experience God more and more. And, and I believe that is what God wants to uh, do in our lives too. <clears throat> so, uh, because there's no unnecessary delay, maybe you could also think and, uh, in the forum later, what are the delays you have in your life? What do you think God is slow in doing in your life, despite you have come before God uh, with all these things that you have? Mm. So actually, while I prepare this uh, message, I also thought of uh, who God made, uh, as in what are the people that God made them wait in, in, in the Bible? So God once made his people wait for 40 years before he gave the Israelites the promised land. So, so, so in Genesis, God already gave the covenant that you, know, you will have your own promised land. Um, but, <coughs> but things just passed by. So, so God also saved Israelites from Egypt. But for a journey that, it's only lately that I realized actually the journey from Egypt to the promised land, right? should only take about four weeks. But God lengthened it to 40 years. So, so in fact, it, the fastest time to reach there is two weeks. And God can do everything and anything, right? Rightfully, God could let you, could let his people, his chosen ones, reach the promised land within two weeks, if not four weeks. Lah. But God has made his people wait for 40 years. Uh, you know, sometimes I also ask when, when going get tough, when too many things bother me. Like, you know, I also will ask God, um, sometimes, uh, why you don't give me house, like when we are about to get married? Everybody seems to have a house before they, they got married. How come me and Wei-En don't have a house? And when I know that I'm pregnant, I also ask God, why we don't have a house? We just want a house, a shelter that is ours. So, but God doesn't seem to be yielding to, to us much. It's perhaps you want this thing so much, you want the house so much, but you just miss out a lot of things God is doing in your lives. But sometimes when I feel very uneasy, I also ask God, why can't this baby just pop out tomorrow? Like, why must I wait for nine months? Like, I still have to endure so much things. When you're sick, you cannot eat a lot of medicines. People don't want to treat you because you're pregnant. And not only so, you went to the hospital, they think very long and want you to sign consent form to say that anything happened is your fault, not our fault. Because you're pregnant, you want to seek treatment. So, so there are so many um, wonderings that I felt, I felt God put me uh, and we earned through also. But, but when I read back this story, right, I think God also asked me one question. If I give you what you want, are you ready for it? Am I ready to be a mom? Uh, just for a three, few weeks period, I just realized that I, I can be a horrible mom. I don't know how to take care of myself. I eat so quickly that I can choke on bones just like that. And my, my husband tell me, the next time how you teach your kids to eat? Ah? Do you know how to chew before you saw? So actually it's true. So I know that God, God is doing something. God is not doing nothing. And, and sometimes we wish things just happen the way you desire, but are you ready for it? God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, but are they ready for the promised land? Do they know that in the promised land, there are also a lot of, uh, non, a lot of people who are not godly? Uh, a lot of people sacrifice babies to, 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 to their own gods and all. Will you, will, you be, will you be affected by the culture there and lost your identity as God's chosen ones? Like, they are out of Egypt. But Egypt is not out of them. When they came out of Egypt, the Egyptian culture, uh, Egyptian mindset, Egyptian food and taste is still in their mouth, is still in their mindset. That's why they complain about why these men are no taste, all those things. But so, so what I want to say is God has reasons in sometimes doing things not as what you desire. You can ask for what you want, but are you ready for it when God truly gives you? And in these 40 years, um, God trained them three things in my opinion and I think this is also the three things that God trained me 
uh, sometimes when I feel that God is delaying certain things, um, first is, I think God let them see what is humility. Humility, see the pride inside your heart. You are not better off than other people, but God loves you and chose you because God is good and faithful. Even when you are idolatrous, even though when you go and worship other people and marry other people and worship their gods, it's not because you are good, you are, you are awful. When the Ten Commandments is given them, they know they are very fearful because they can't do it. They think so high of themselves, they are ready for it, but they are not ready for it. So God humbles them. So I think a lot of times when you seem to be put through a process, God teaches you one thing, humility. The second thing is spirituality. God makes them go through a 40 years instead of, instead of a 4 weeks to let them know that men do not live on bread alone, do not live on the food alone, but on every word that comes out from God. Men live on what Moses tells them when they hear from God. And third thing is God teach them about faith. Yes, in these 40 years, everywhere they go is rock. Where they, everywhere they go is rock and rock and rock. Nothing new. No entertainment, no Hollywood, no, nothing that can really hype up their interest in things. But they are never in lack in a wilderness, in a desert. They, they want water, they got water. They want food, they got manna and quail. And not only so, they got nothing to fight a war, but God delivers enemy into their hands. So what God is trying to teach them is faith. Faith not in what you can, what you see, but in God for who He is. And I realized that these are the three things that God also trained a lot of us in our lives. Humility, spirituality, and faith. So, <clears throat> so remember, um, God is not doing nothing. Can you see what God is doing as you pray? And don't mistake the waiting in God as importance of God, meaning God is uh, not almighty, not sovereign. And the last question um, is, will God, find you, will God find you faithful when he returns? So for the last two weeks, we read about the Son of Man will return when you are, you are most not expecting it. When you are eating and drinking, he comes at a time when um, that doesn't look like a special time. It's a normal time that you least expect it. And Jesus end, end the parable with it. But will God Will God find you faithful when he returns? And I must say, being one of God's people doesn't always make life easy and convenient. Like what we read in the responsive readings, the world hates us. But God also gives us the reason to be faithful. That is, he gives us the word. He also gives us the Holy Spirit inside us to remind us of his presence. So I think a lot of times we have a lot of questions to God. We say, mm, we often think of a lot of questions to ask God when we want to next time see him face to face, like, God, why, why is there evil in this world? Why is there suffering? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Like, we, we might think of a lot of questions we want to ask God, but little do we think of God will also ask you a question. Dear God, will I find you faithful? Are you faithful to what I've told you? Do you trust me? And do you hold on to me when going to get tough? So, don't think of it as a one-way traffic. Think of it as a mutual uh, conversation with God next time. And, and I, I like what Augustine, St. Augustine uh, says before, when faith fails, prayer dies. So in order to pray, then you must have faith. So one, one litmus test to examine if you are holding onto faith in God is to also examine your own prayer life. Do you pray? And what do you do when you do not seem to have a answered prayers? Do you press on because you trust in God or do you give up? And stand yourself being toyed by Satan with a lot, a lot of thoughts in your mind that start to make you stray away from God. And, and the reason why God asks us to, to keep our faith strong through keep going to Him is because while there are many things that are revealed to you, there are also many more things that are not revealed to our limited mind. We are not God. If we were to put in everything that God has in his mind, we probably will go crazy because we are just a creation. How do you understand what your creator is thinking? Totally 100%. But 
But God revealed to us enough for us to move on in faith with Him. So, so a lot of times when you feel that you are being uh, treated unrighteously, when you are being bullied, when people seems to be people who are influential in this world, like the unjust judge, seems to be having an upper hand in our life. Like, why do you have to be so miserable? You remember, this is not the end. While a lot of things you know, there are also a lot of things you don't know. You may know people treat you like that, but there are many more things that you do not know. Like, like for example, we, we read in Job, like Job is in a lot of sufferings and all. But does he know what happens in the beginning? The conversation Satan has with God. That God tells Satan, you can only harm it to this level. You can only touch Job as how much I allow you to touch him. Does Job know this part of the story? This is too incomprehensible to him at that point of time. So, but we are given the privilege to know it because it is written in the Bible. Beyond the things that is revealed to you, there are many more things that you might not see it directly. Like God is actually limiting Satan's power or very bad people's power in your life. Do you know that? Can you trust in God when things are very uh, uncertain and very uh, chaotic in your life? And so, so you remember, not sure, you know, we, we, some time back we promote this book, Pilgrim's Progress. So Christian, right, the, the character in this, in this book, he, he's going so many ups and downs in his journey of faith with God. But eventually, when you reach the end, then only you realize, oh, it's like that. You see two lions in front. It's like the, the attack of the Satan is coming to you so strong. But these lions are actually trained by God. They are chains that is controlled by God. God controls how much they can go forward and backward. So in a way, God is in control. God is not doing nothing. But when, when things are not, like, you know, when things are very perplexed in your mind and you don't seem to be able to reconcile with all these things, God wants to encourage you to trust in Him because He is better than you know Him to be. He is far more sovereign and in control than you think He is. And because of that, in faith, you keep on praying. So, with this, I end today's uh, message. Um, there's a lot of things we can do when we are struggling, when we are fighting for justice, when we are trying to get out of certain problems and struggles. There are many things we can do, but there's only one necessary thing, that is to pray persistently, to hold on to faith with God. And prayer is never the least you can do. It is always the most we can do. Because God is good all the time and He is deeply committed to His children. And for this, we can keep on praying. <clears throat> okay, I have come to the end of my message. Thank God for bringing me through. Okay, amazingly, I don't cough much. I was coughing very badly through the night. So, God is in control. So let's pray. Dear Lord, oh, thank you for loving us. Lord, we have come through many chapters of your Gospels. At times we hear, we hear you asking your disciples, do you still not understand? Lord, sometimes you are also asking us, do you still not understand who I am? Do you still not understand who you are? You are love, children of God. Lord, um, as we come to today's uh, very simple message, Lord, you teach us that we are truly uh, people who really in need of you. And there are times that we don't seem to be able to press on praying. For many reasons, uh, we run away from crying to you. But Lord, may you today reveal to us that uh, there's no reason that should hinder us from coming to you. Because God, you are who you are. And you want us to come to you because you are always in control. And you love us. And you are always just. And because of that, we can trust in you even when things cast doubts into our journey of faith. And Lord, I pray that though your servant is inadequate, the word that is from your very Bible, from your very mouth, can work in the hearts of brothers and sisters so that they can be encouraged not to lose heart in prayers and to even see the greater reason to keep on praying. And Lord, we know that in this world we will have sufferings. You have clearly told us 
but you also have told us that you have overcome the world. And so, Lord, um, uphold us uh, in your righteousness, uphold us uh, in your love, so that we can continue to walk the journey of faith boldly and not lose heart in our prayers. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.